A hot summer day on a quiet highway, a few miles outside the town of Indio, changed the fate of young and ambitious Jamie Bowie forever. At that fateful moment, when her car broke down in the middle of the desert, she had no idea that the help offered by a seemingly friendly couple would turn out to be her worst nightmare. The ruthless criminals hiding behind the masks of well-wishers became her angels of death that night. The fatal gunshot in the desert began an agonizing search for the truth that plunged not only her family, but the entire small town into mourning. Months passed without success, but then the tragic mystery began to unfold. Caught up in this gruesome maelstrom of events, the police finally got on the trail of brutal killers whose crimes were as shocking as they were cynical. It wasn't just an act of violence, it was cold-blooded murder disguised as a random roadside assistance. Now, investigators face the darkest corners of human nature as they uncover the horrifying details of that night and pursue criminals willing to do anything for their own gain. Jamie Bowie's story is a grim reminder of how an easy trust can turn into a deadly trap and how evil sometimes hides beneath the most innocent mask. Under questioning, Billy presented a different picture to investigators. He immediately began to accuse his wife Hilda of this brutal crime, but his story contradicted all the facts that had already been proven at this point. It was quite obvious to the police officers who was actually the author of this bloodthirsty murder. Billy had a criminal record, so the whole situation was very clear to the investigators. Eventually, the prosecutor's office offered Hilda a plea bargain. She had to testify truthfully against her spouse. Under state law, the crime carried the death penalty, so Hilda agreed to cooperate with the prosecution. She pleaded guilty to first-degree murder, though, didn't actually pull the trigger. She did not kidnap Jamie, but she refused any opposition to the killer. Throughout the investigation, Hilda never once testified against the perpetrator. During all the bloody events, she did not even warn the victim herself, although she had the opportunity. Therefore, she clearly deserved a prison sentence. Months of futile searches and unsuccessful attempts to find clues in the case of Jamie Bowie's disappearance passed. But at the time, no one could have imagined that this tragedy would be the prologue to solving one of the darkest, and most brutal crimes of our time. Silence and despair slowly shackled the hearts of her loved ones, until finally the first ray of hope appeared, a call from a random witness who changed the course of the investigation forever. And so, after a year and a half long nightmare, the moment of truth arrived. The police found her blue convertible, repainted black and abandoned on the side of the road. This car, a mute witness to a horrific crime, became the key to unlocking all the sinister mysteries. Gradually, as if out of the darkness, the sinister figures behind this heinous crime began to emerge. Let me introduce you to Billy Ray Ricks and his wife Hilda, a couple whose lives became intertwined with Jamie's in one fateful moment. Billy is a brutal killer with a criminal past, and Hilda is his intimidated but silent accomplice. They are the embodiment of the darkness itself, hiding behind the masks of ordinary people. Now that their true faces are revealed, it's time to find out what really happened that terrible night. Let's find out all the gruesome details that gradually brought to light the horrifying truth of how Jamie's trust became her death sentence. Let's dive into this dark world where mercy turns to betrayal and life hangs in the balance with cruelty and indifference. The heroine of this story was a beautiful girl who dreamed of a Hollywood career. Like most such stories, everything started out beautifully, but her gullibility cost her her life. The girl disappeared, and while the police collected information all over Los Angeles, her family was so desperate that they literally went on foot to search for her traveling hundreds of miles. 
On the evening of Monday, April 16, 1990, Brian Bowie was awaiting the return of his 24-year-old sister. She had taken a trip to Phoenix earlier in the weekend to visit family and a friend, but was going to be back in Los Angeles by the beginning of the work week. The girl's name was Jamie Bowie. She definitely wouldn't miss this Monday, as she had to go out for her first day of work at a major Hollywood studio, participating in an important project. Her brother was waiting for her return at the apartment they shared to meet and celebrate Jamie's future successes. But the girl was still gone. Brian thought that she had been delayed on the road and would arrive later, so he just went to bed, as he had to get up early. In the middle of the night, he heard the sound of keys being used to open the door lock. He was startled out of his sleep at first, but immediately assumed it was his sister returning from her trip. Brian was very tired and didn't want to get up, so he just rolled over to the other side and fell asleep. The young man woke up in the morning when the sun was already up. Brian immediately went to check on his sister, but she was nowhere to be found. The boy walked around the apartment and noticed that some things were not in their places. They had obviously been moved, but this did not give any clues as to what had happened during the night and where Jamie was now. There was no cell phone service at the time, and there was no way for Brian to find out what was wrong with his sister. He remembered hearing the noise of the door opening in the middle of the night and assumed that his sister had returned, changed her clothes, moved her things in the process, and left early in the morning before he got up. But by arrangement, she was supposed to wake her brother, if not during the night when she arrived, at least in the morning when she got up herself. But for some reason she didn't. The young man was confused, so he assumed that his sister was away on urgent important business. She could have had car trouble or something to do with her new job. Either way, he needed to get ready, so he began to go about his business. Brian left his sister a note and left. The real scare for Brian came in the evening when he got home and found the note untouched and his sister not home. It became obvious that Jamie hadn't come over. This was doubly strange since she was due to go out for her dream job soon and had been preparing for it so much. The girl was generally responsible and did not miss such events without apparent reason or warning. Even more frightening was the fact that someone had obviously been in the apartment during the day when my brother had been away. Things in the rooms were scattered, the stereo, a suitcase, and a few valuables were missing. Brian realized that his sister wouldn't do that. Throw things around and take valuables. There was definitely an intruder in the apartment. His brother was afraid to stay in the apartment alone, so a frightened Brian rushed to a friend who lived nearby to call the police. When law enforcement officers arrived at the call, the victim described to them the events of the last few days. The missing girl's brother believed that her disappearance could have been related to an apartment invasion and robbery. However, the arriving officers did not pay much attention to his words. They thought it was a simple burglary, as there were no signs of kidnapping or struggle with the victim in the room, no blood or weapons. In their opinion, Jamie was clearly not here, and any speculation by his brother was premature. The cops filed a theft report, inspected the house, and then decided to make sure Jamie had nothing to do with what had happened. They called her family in Phoenix. According to the family, the girl left them on time, and they never saw her again. After that, the police voiced their assumptions that she could have gotten stuck on the road, because it's a long way, about 372 miles. Her car might have broken down, so she would return as soon as she had solved all the problems that had arisen. After that, they left the house at once. Despite this, the brother thought something was wrong here. He moved to live with a friend for a while because it was not safe to stay in the apartment. Brian reported everything that had happened to his parents, who agreed with their son that there were suspicious aspects to the case. They felt that something bad had happened to their daughter. Therefore, the mother went to the local police station in Arizona and filed a report about Jamie's disappearance. 
those police officers immediately got to work. The information about the disappearance of the young girl was immediately broadcast on the radio throughout the state, after which a nationwide system was launched to search for missing persons. To that end, the mother provided photos of the girl as well as a description of how her daughter was dressed before she went missing. According to the family, the girl wore bright pink pants and a light-colored top. During this period, the missing person's father, Joe, and brother printed flyers with her picture on them, distributed and posted them in both cities, and made printouts of her car, a blue 1978 Volkswagen Beetle convertible, issue. They also distributed flyers along the route that was most likely to bring the girl home. The scale of the work done by the relatives can hardly be overestimated. The relatives of the missing woman set themselves an ambitious task. They had to track their missing Jamie on hundreds of miles of state highway, as well as search for her vehicle. The trip from Phoenix to Los Angeles took at least six to seven hours. Jamie had to travel on State Highway 10 westbound. To cover this entire area, the family split up so they traveled this route daily. Parts of the road sections were traveled on foot, visiting all the motels, cafes, and roadside gas stations that were encountered along the way that Jamie could visit. The family talked to hundreds of people, grabbing for any leads, but were unable to get any useful information about the missing 24-year-old. The massive search operation organized by the relatives made a lot of noise among the locals. Rumors began to spread that the girl had been kidnapped and the police were not even investigating the case. This excitement forced the police officers to take up the work more actively and analyze the incident again. The detectives came to the conclusion that the robbery of the apartment and the disappearance of the man could still be connected because both incidents occurred at about the same time. The missing person's loved ones also continued their search. Jamie's mother constantly put up flyers on the nearest stretch of road and even acted as an investigator, interviewing the owners of all roadside establishments. Even the police officers were amazed at the zeal the woman showed. Detectives had never once seen in their practice that a mother was involved in such a massive operation to find her own child. Normally, people lose control of themselves and their composure, but this woman acted so clearly and confidently, desperate to find her daughter. It's hard to imagine the emotions she felt and the heartbreak she felt throughout this search and rescue operation. The brother and father were doing similar work trying to trace the path the girl would take to return from out of state to Los Angeles. They were also handing out flyers and talking to people, trying to find out anything. The situation was complicated by the fact that along the way, there were stretches of wilderness with no people or infrastructure, which could have been dangerous to her life and made the search more difficult. Time passed and there were no leads. It already seemed that it would never be possible to find this grain of sand in the desert, but suddenly, the efforts of the missing girl's relatives were justified. Sometime after the rescue operation was launched, several random motorists who had heard about the missing girl responded to their distress and called the police. They said they saw an attractive girl in a blue Volkswagen Beetle convertible that matched Jamie's description. She was standing on the side of the road, and it appeared that her vehicle was having some kind of trouble. Witnesses also described a pair of dark-skinned men who decided to help the girl fix her car. They stood next to her and helped the young beauty, so other drivers did not offer their help, noticing nothing suspicious. It is worth noting that the missing girl was quite a bright and attractive girl, and her beauty, as well as a conspicuous car, attracted the attention of motorists who remembered her. This information allowed the detectives to get vital clues. After getting the vital clues, the detectives went to the scene of the motorist witnesses. Here they met the truckers who recognized Jamie from the photo and confirmed that they had seen her. They told the investigators all the details. According to the truckers, they were resting at a truck stop when, not far from them, 
A girl stopped on the side of the road, got out of her car, and opened the hood as her engine was smoking. Just then, a couple in a red automobile pulled up beside her. The driver, a man, and his wife, a passenger, helped Jamie start the engine, after which she drove on. The truckers claimed that the people who stopped to help pulled out following her and moved a short distance away from her. The headlights dimmed until they disappeared over the horizon. This happened roughly in the center of this deserted highway. At first, this situation did not raise any questions among the truckers. But after learning of the girl's disappearance, they began to have doubts and suspect that the Good Samaritans who had stopped on the road to help Jamie were actually involved in her disappearance. Police officers continued their operation to find the missing person and concentrated their efforts on that stretch of road. They checked the central part of the desert, where there was the best chance of finding the crime victim. Hundreds of miles of road were checked, but nothing could be found. The blue convertible literally fell through the ground. The situation was made much more complicated by the fact that this was an era without the internet. People didn't have cell phones, and it was much harder to communicate with each other. There was no geotagging and GPS tracking, no CCTV cameras. Police officers used the only opportunity they had to attract attention and alert motorists traveling on this stretch of state highway. They put up a large poster with an image of the girl and her vehicle. Law enforcement officials asked for any information that could advance the investigation and help find the missing person. Naturally, the department immediately began receiving calls from random people who were just trying to make themselves known, but in no way helped the investigation. About 200 calls were received, which did not bring the expected result. A lot of time was wasted processing this information. The situation changed about a month after Jamie Bowie was reported missing. The police station received a call from a witness who was working in a citrus orchard. While making his rounds of the grounds, he discovered the body of a man in the irrigation system. Police officers immediately went to the scene and found the body of a girl there in very poor condition. According to her clothes, she strongly resembled the missing person. Bright pink pants and a light-colored top, similar to those described by loved ones. However, investigators did not hurry with identification until the results of forensic examination. Based on the degree of decomposition, police determined that the body had been there for the entire search operation, about a month. In addition to suggesting the victim's identity, a shotgun shell was found at the scene. Due to decomposition, it was impossible to determine the cause of death without an autopsy, but the cartridge clearly indicated that the girl could have been shot. If she was indeed the victim of the shooter, then the citrus orchard was the scene of the crime. The medical examiner, during the autopsy of the body, determined that the victim had been shot twice. The forensic examiner determined that the first shot was fired while the girl was standing on the ground. The assailant probably pointed the weapon at her, and she made an instinctive defensive movement with her arm. She probably tried to run away, but the assailant reacted faster. The shot damaged her limb and hit her face and head. The medical examiner recognized this attack as fatal. Afterward, the girl fell into an irrigation system and was hit with a control shot in the back. The victim was identified from dental records as the missing Jamie Bowie. Now the worst fears of detectives and the missing woman's family have been confirmed. Her last resting place was a citrus orchard near Indio, California. It became clear to investigators why the victim could not be found before, as this is a very desolate and remote area, and it was possible to see the body in the irrigation ditch only when directly confronted with it. You can't see it from a distance. Besides, there are hardly any people here, only wild animals. Everyone was shocked. The friendly and beautiful girl, bright and ambitious, was loved by all her relatives and friends, especially her brother, with whom she was very close. She was the eldest and had always protected Brian as a child. She had her whole life ahead of her, 
and who could have cut it off so ruthlessly? The brother of the deceased told investigators that she always dreamed of working in Hollywood and just a few days before her death, finally officially employed there. Jamie became a PR manager for a major studio. While the family tried to come to terms with the loss of their beloved daughter and prepared for her funeral, the detectives continued to look for any clues to reach the criminal. It was urgent to find and stop the dangerous criminal. However, there were no witnesses to the crime. Detectives believed that the key to the clue was the car of the murdered, a blue convertible Volkswagen Beetle, which no one had seen since the girl helped to repair it dark-skinned strangers. The police paid special attention to the search for this suspicious couple who were following Jamie and probably had something to do with her death. Months of unsuccessful searches ensued. About a year and a half after the brutal murder, the police station received a call that a blue car had been found. It was a convertible. The license plates matched the wanted car, but there was one oddity with it. The car had been repainted black. The convertible had clearly been abandoned. The police officers examined the car closely, but there were no clues inside. They had to find out who was driving the car, so they put together a press conference to solicit potential witnesses through the media. That didn't always work, but there was nothing to do, so the cops hoped someone would respond. This time, there was a witness who called and bluntly said he saw his neighbor driving the vehicle. That statement stunned the investigators. They questioned the eyewitness in detail, and he gave a tip about his neighbor. Police called the suspect in for questioning after they tracked him down. However, this neighbor only made things more complicated as he told detectives that he had stolen this car several months ago. Detectives promised him protection from theft charges if he would provide valuable information to advance the investigation. The man agreed to these terms. He honestly told them that he stole the car and discovered that it had electrical problems. Afterward, he brought it to an auto service center. When the owner of the service asked him if the car was stolen because he had seen a similar case with another person, the thief was afraid of being exposed and decided to ditch the convertible. He repainted it black and drove it away from his house. The hijacker gave the address of an automobile repair shop where the police went. There, they found out who had previously contacted the mechanic with a problem car. That's how the detectives found the store owner from whom the car had been stolen. They met with the man and he told them that he had purchased the convertible from a dark-skinned couple who had come in a red Volkswagen. Again in the investigation, this couple surfaced who first helped the girl with car repairs and then sold her vehicle. Obviously, they knew what had happened to Jamie. Investigators began to question the store owner more vigorously to get him to give them leads on how to get to the couple. He provided them with a vehicle sales contract that turned out to be dated just the day after Jamie was reported missing. That document had the seller's signature on it. Suddenly, a case that had gone unsolved for over a year began to move forward at a breakneck pace. The deed listed one Billy Ray Ricks. He was 45 years old at the time. He and his spouse, 28-year-old Hill, lived in the Los Angeles area. Detectives analyzed the suspect's identity and learned that the man had a violent criminal history. Billy was known for killing his own brother in a fight. His criminal career began on the streets of Los Angeles when he broke out the windows of a police office in Compton in the 70s. He specialized in stealing Volkswagen Beetle cars which no longer seemed like a coincidence to them. Everything fit together. Billy was a bloodthirsty monster capable of brutal murder, and Jamie had a chance encounter with him on the road that turned out tragic for her. When the detectives arrived at the couple's home, they were not home. It turned out they were already on the run. The police sought help from the media and announced the two African Americans as one of the most wanted men in America. After the information was widely publicized, it turned out that the criminal couple had many more enemies than friends.
The police station was literally flooded with calls, with evidence of where the Ricks were and what they were doing. It became known that Billy had a plane ticket to the Turks and Caicos Islands, a former British colony in the Caribbean. He only stayed in town because he was having trouble getting a passport. Police officers learned where the suspects were hiding through tips and ambushed them in a parking lot, apprehending them as soon as they were outside the house. After the arrest, it was decided to separate them to reconcile statements and extract a confession. The pair were brought to a citrus orchard in Indio in separate vehicles. During this period, 28-year-old Hilda Ricks was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. She was deprived of communication with her spouse. The woman had also received no information from the police, so her fear skyrocketed. This was in the hands of the investigation, since a person in such a state is easy to crack, which is what happened. In the interrogation room, Hilda repeated the story known to the police about Jamie's disappearance, but with new, bloodthirsty details. According to her, they met the girl on State Highway 10. Jamie's car stalled on the road due to engine trouble, and Billy offered to help. He started the car, but told the girl that she needed to go to the service right away, so he offered to follow her to escort her to the nearest place where the car could be repaired or to the city itself where she would be safe. Jamie agreed and trusted the strangers. After they reached the nearest settlement, Jamie invited the couple to dinner at a restaurant, expressing her gratitude. She even offered to pay the man for his work once she received her first paycheck at her new job. Jamie clearly trusted the criminals, and they unceremoniously took advantage of that. At first, Billy told his spouse that he would simply take the car from a random victim in his usual scheme. Hilda didn't resist or cross her spouse, as she knew that it was better not to argue with her husband. However, the matter came to a head. Next. The couple had a shotgun, and although Hilda didn't suspect that her husband intended to kill Jamie, she confessed that the plot began to involve the girl's death at the exact moment she treated them to a meal at the restaurant. When Jamie got up from the table to go to the restroom, Billy confessed his intentions to his wife and discussed in detail with his spouse how things would happen. She ended up having to obey her husband since she could get hurt herself. Jamie then got into her car and drove off with the couple following her. At some point, the criminals stopped her car and kidnapped the girl. They tried to use her card at an ATM 62 miles outside of Los Angeles. Then they drove to a bank in Indio and tried again, but there was no money in the account. According to Hilda, she initially tried to talk Billy out of this murderous scheme, but soon gave up the effort because she feared for her own life. She was clearly in the minority in this relationship. The man dominated her and probably did not hesitate to use physical force to convince his wife that he was right. As a result, Hilda had spent the entire journey knowing that the young beauty they had helped with her husband was doomed. The woman watched in silence as he led Jamie to her death deep into the desert. He ordered her to turn off her headlights and she obeyed. Then in the darkness, she heard two gunshots back to the car, only Billy had returned. Hilda didn't know exactly what he had done to Jamie, but she had no doubt that the girl was dead. However, she remained silent and didn't ask her husband anything. But Billy didn't stop there. He plotted to rob Jamie's apartment, since he had left her keys in his possession. He took her driver's license, which gave him the exact address. Billy did break into the apartment when Jamie's brother was sleeping inside, but he didn't know that and was only interested in valuables to steal. After taking what he needed, he left the apartment. If at that moment Jamie's brother had woken up and left the room, an unenviable fate would have awaited him, but he was lucky not to wake up in the middle of the night. But the criminal didn't stop there either. He returned to the apartment in the afternoon for more valuables. Some of the stolen items were later found during a search of the apartment where the criminals lived, 
and some of the missing property was found in a Denver pawn shop. The criminals admitted that they were selling the items for $2,000. Their goal was to get some money. That's why the car was sold for such a small amount of money. In the end, Hilda received a life sentence with parole eligibility after 25 years. At the trial, she testified against Billy. The trial began in 1994, and the prosecution had only one major problem, lack of physical evidence. At the time, DNA testing was not yet common, and there was no other technology that could provide important evidence. Billy also wanted to plea bargain with the prosecution, but he was denied, so the man tried to make himself look insane to avoid responsibility for his bloodthirsty acts, but that plan didn't work either. He never confessed to his involvement in Jamie Bowie's death. The jury analyzed the case file at length and emotionally. Billy Ray Ricks was found guilty of premeditated murder and theft. He was facing the death penalty, which he feared, and the jury unanimously upheld this decision for the cruel treatment of the young beauty from whom he took away the future. This court decision was a welcome point for Bowie's bereaved family, who had been struggling mightily to get over Jamie's tragic death. The family believed that the girl was a victim of her own defenselessness and excessive trust in strangers, paying for it with her life. Hilda Ricks was released from prison in November 2014. Billy's killer made multiple appeals, which were denied. He is still on death row waiting for his sentence to be carried out.